It's so wonderful to be able to dive into God's word and see what it has to say about a whole variety of things that we wrestle with today. I want to begin by asking a very simple question. At least it would appear to be quite simple. What does it mean to have real freedom? What does real freedom look like? Does it mean that any and every obstacle that's in the way of doing what I want is removed? Would that be a good definition of freedom? Getting the debris, getting the obstacles out of the way so I can do what I would like to do. In Oregon, is freedom smoking my weed and driving whatever speed I might choose to drive? What really is freedom? Jesus in the midst of a debate with the Pharisees, said, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. That's, that's interesting. Look at that. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Why isn't it just if the Son sets you free, you will be free, period, stop? Why does Jesus add the adverb at the end of that statement. You will be free indeed. That Greek adverb means really, truly, certainly. Hmm. Why does Jesus add that? Could it be that Jesus is suggesting to us that there's another kind of freedom? There's a faux freedom, a phony freedom, a freedom that's a cheap Im imitation of the real thing, a freedom that in many ways is defective? No thanks. I don't want that. I don't want that. I've read too many accounts of people that have sacrificed for freedom, of people that have fought for freedom, of people that have died for freedom. If you've got to go to that much effort to obtain freedom, I don't want a cheap imitation. I want the real thing. How about you? Yeah. We want true freedom. When Paul wrote to the Galatian churches in the first century, they were facing two equally dangerous threats. One threat was legalism, and the other threat was license. The Galatians were having trouble with a legalism that robbed them of their gospel freedom. And Paul addresses another potential problem, which is a license that corrupts true freedom. Legalism is the belief you can be righteous by following rules. In this case, following the law of Moses. For most of the letter, in fact, Paul is dealing with those who had come to faith in Jesus but were in serious danger of deserting their faith and going back to their old way of believing, which was, I've got to keep the law. I've got to keep the law. That will make God happy. Wow. Paul makes it so clear, doesn't he? Those of you that have studied the New Testament in depth, he makes it so clear that gospel and law simply don't mix. They simply don't mix. In fact, gospel and law are like oil and water. When you try to live by rules to please God, you end up doing one of two things. 
you either end up discouraged and say, I can't do this, or you keep the rules in your mind and gain pride but lose your freedom. Neither of those options sound good to me. So legalism, that's not, the, that's not the way to go. That's not the way you find freedom, thinking that you can please God by keeping all the rules and then patting yourself on the back in your pride. It doesn't work. But there's another threat. And if Paul, in chapter 5 of Galatians, verses 1 to 12, deals with that problem of legalism, in chapter 5, verse 13 to 16, he deals with license, the other side of this. License is the idea that you can live any way you choose. And this amounts to abusing your freedom. Now, Paul didn't want the Galatians losing their freedom or abusing their freedom. Neither of those things would be good for them. And neither of those things are good for us. So how does Paul put it when he writes to the Galatians? Let's look at chapter 5 and verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brothers. This is what God has called you to. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Would you, would you say that verse with me? Good and loud. Let's hear it. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Ah, this is the way freedom is supposed to work. But you know, we read that verse and the word flesh just jumps out at us because we don't use flesh in our everyday language. If I cut myself, I don't say, oh, I cut my flesh. I say, I cut my arm or I cut my hand. You go to a restaurant to order a steak and the waiter says, how would you like your steak? I've never heard anyone say, I prefer my flesh medium well. Ooh, all the vegans gag. We just don't use that word flesh. And so we read a verse like this, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh and we're kind of in a fog. What does that word flesh mean? Does it mean the physical flesh of a human or an animal? Sometimes. Is it metaphorical? As in Genesis 6, 12, when it says all flesh had corrupted itself on the face of the earth, meaning all humanity. Does that word mean humanity? Humanity? Or does it mean human nature? Or does it mean a sinful, corrupt human nature? Some modern translations use the phrase sinful nature, an interpretation of that word flesh, which is sarx in Greek. In English letters, it would just be S-A-R-X. Some modern translations use the phrase sinful self, Yet another one uses the phrase physical desires. Physical desires aren't wrong in themselves. One translation even says something to the effect, don't use your freedom as an excuse to vent your corrupt nature. None of these phrases really captures the whole picture and you have to be careful when you read the scripture and you come on that word flesh to know whether it's being used in a metaphorical or ethical context or more literally. But one of the best big definitions of that word flesh in its ethical context was given years and years ago by a man named William Barclay in his book, flesh and spirit. 
I'm going to put it up on the screen and, and let's see what this kind of lengthy definition of the word flesh looks like. He says, quote, the flesh is what man has made himself in contrast with man as God made him. The flesh is man as he has allowed himself to become in contrast with man as God meant him to be. The flesh stands for the total effect upon man of his own sin and of the sin of his fathers and of the sin of all men who have gone before him. The flesh is human nature as it has become through sin. The flesh stands for human nature weakened, vitiated, tainted by sin. The flesh is man as he is apart from Jesus Christ and his spirit, end quote. Well, that's a lot to memorize, but Paul is essentially telling us here there is something within us. We have both inherited and enhanced, and it's not good. It's corrupt, it's selfish, and it's sinful. Now, there is a myth that is alive and well, sad to say, in our culture these days. One of the great myths that people believe about freedom. And here is this great myth that perhaps a majority of our population embraces. I can do whatever I want to do as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. Have you ever heard that? <laughs> of course we have. And we could put many other words in here. I can think whatever I want to think. I can let my mind go wherever it wants to go as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. I can feel however I want to feel. If I feel a victim, if I feel oppressed, if this, that, I can feel anything I want as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. I cannot do or refuse to do anything I want to refuse to do as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. I can live any way I want to live as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. It's like that tagline, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody, makes a license view of freedom legitimate. But what's wrong with this statement? I put it up here. This statement assumes First of all, that a human being is an island. That you can go into the mansion, enter a room, shut the door, and you don't affect anybody else. I've told you before, culture is not a mansion, it's a swimming pool. And if you say, I can pee in my end of the pool, that's not going to work out well. <laughs> but that's not how people think. People think you can do whatever you want as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. That you are an island to yourself. And then, most people don't believe that evil is contagious. That it spreads. That it can spread like a pandemic. Therefore, you can barter for virtue by giving consent to vice. Let's unpack this. First of all, am I an island? Are you an island? Heavens, no. One thing I love about our young people and our young adult community here at Morning Star is that they, for the most part, value community, being together. Why is that important? Relationships are important. You can't thrive. You can't flourish. You can't be who God meant you to be living like a holy hermit. 
Now, it's okay to be an introvert. I am one of those weird people. I value alone time. You can have your alone time, but you cannot live forever like an island. You need others. Whether you want to admit it or not, you are a relational being. Would you say, I am a relational being? I am a relational. Come on, introverts. It's got to be louder than that. I am a relational being. How do I know that? Because you're made in the image of God. You're made in God's image. And that means many things. But among those many things, it means it means you're relational because God is relational. Father, Son, Holy Spirit have existed for all eternity in loving communion, in loving fellowship, in perfect holiness. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, three persons. God made us in his image. Therefore, we are created for relationship. Relationship. That is so important. But to maintain community, to be able to really truly be together as God wants us to be together, there must be purity and there must be honesty. So there can be trust in that community. You see, evil is contagious. It's very contagious. And one of the ways that God shows this is the way he trains his ancient people, Israel. In the Old Testament, you could say that many passages are helping those ancient people of God learn their ABCs of evil, what it's like. And so, in the Older Testament, we read passages about mildew, how to contain it, how to keep it from spreading, leprosy, how do you keep from contaminating another person with this disease or that disease. And we read that, and if we think it's just about health and hygiene, I think we're missing the boat. God's giving a picture of how evil operates. And guess what? we find the same principle in the New Testament. In fact, Paul wrote to the Corinthians. And one reason is because they were fe failing to deal with a man who was living in gross immorality within the church at Corinth. They were just saying, oh, let it be, let it be. And that words of that famous Beatles song. And so you know what Paul said to him? In 1 Corinthians 5, 6, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Wow. A little bit of sin can infect other people. We don't always know how it happens. But Paul says, a little bit of leaven can leaven the whole lump of dough. What he's saying is, evil doesn't just stay on an island. Evil spreads. It never remains dormant. It is always active. That's just the nature of evil. And because evil is contagious, it's not okay to barter for virtue by giving consent to vice. What do we mean by that statement? Well, it's something like this. I really need to support that guy that wants to open an adult bookstore right next to the church. Because if I don't support his freedom to open an adult bookstore next to the church, then my freedom may be in jeopardy. So we make this bargain to ensconce the devil's diversity, and things just go downhill. 
because evil spreads. Evil always asks for equal time, and then it ends up taking all the time. Evil always asks, ah, I just want a seat at the table. And before you know it, evil says, if you don't affirm my evil seat at the table, you can't come to dinner at all. That's how evil works. Go all the way back to 1925 and the big debate over evolution and creation, the Scopes trial in Tennessee. What were the evolutionists saying at that point? They were not saying, we need to take this stupid myth of creation out of the textbooks. No, they were not saying that. You know, that movie, Inherit the Wind, is such a misleading account of the Scopes trial. What the evolutionists were saying is we just, want, we just want a seat at the table. We just want to be side by side with those who teach creation in our schools. That's all we want. How's that working out? That's the way evil works. That's the way it functions. So I beg you, please don't buy into the very popular libertinism idea of freedom that is so prevalent in our culture today. So if freedom is not a free-for-all, if freedom, however, begins with a negative, freedom from, is there a positive side? Yeah, it's in verse 13. Look what it says. But through love, serve one another. That's what freedom is for. That's what freedom is for. So we have no obstacles to loving one another, serving one another, encouraging one another, helping one another grow as we need to grow. You see, freedom is not just freedom from. Freedom is freedom for. Freedom is for service. Now, look what, what it says in Exodus, the second book of the Bible. When God told Moses to go to Pharaoh, and, and God gave a message to Moses, and from Moses to Aaron, and from Aaron to Pharaoh, what was that message? Let my people go period, stop? No. Again and again and again, it was let my people go that they may serve me. Let my people go that they may sacrifice to me in the wilderness. Let my people go that they may serve me. Multiple times in that account of Moses and Aaron before Pharaoh, it's let them go for service, for worship. That's, that's what freedom is for. We are set free by God to serve God, and we serve God by serving one another. That's, that's the first thing I want you to get. Freedom is for service. It's for service. In verses 14 and 15, Paul gives his reasoning. Look at Galatians 5, 14 and 15. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, love. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, but if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you're not consumed by one another. Paul seems to be saying here that this freedom defined as libertinism turns us into animals, makes us unreasonable, irrational, competitive, attacking one another. Because libertinism 
is a selfish form of freedom. Paul says this is not what freedom is for. Freedom is not so I can have my time, my toys, my inter- uninterrupted plans, my money. Do you know the one word? Parents never have to teach toddlers. We had four children, and I don't think we taught Tiffany, Beth, Scotty, or Lindsay. I know we didn't sit down and say, okay, Tiffany, say m m mine. That just comes natural, doesn't it? Mine. I, I was going to show you a video this morning, and I probably should have. You know, you Google toddler fights. It is hilarious. <laughs> Put two toddlers in a room with one toy, and I guarantee you it will be a tug of war. It will be screaming, and it will be the word mine, mine, mine. That's what we think freedom is for. It's for me. Nope. It's for serving others. Well, now that we know a little better what freedom is, how can we, with all of our weaknesses, all of our inadequacies, all of our shortcomings, keep from abusing freedom, misusing freedom, or, God forbid, losing freedom? our freedom. The answer's in the very next verse, in verse 16. Paul says, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. That's it. Walk by the Spirit, and you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. This is the key to true freedom, not faux freedom. Be filled with the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. Be empowered by the Spirit. Let your life be completely surrendered to God's Spirit. You know, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ at conversion, at that point, you became the temple of the Holy Spirit. Did you know that? God's Holy Spirit lives within you. Is that not amazing? That God, through his Holy Spirit, lives in those of you that have confessed Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's amazing. This is good news. This is our second point. Freedom is protected when we walk by the Spirit. And we'll learn a little bit more about what that looks like, what it is to walk in the Spirit. But, but please... Oh, I beg you, if you are leading someone in their walk of faith, if you are discipling them, helping them understand what the Christian life is all about, you must, you must, you must make them aware of the fact that this life of following Jesus involves an intense internal battle. They're going to be shocked if you don't warn them. <laughs> they're, they're, going to, they're going to get hit up the side of the head and, and wonder what in the world hit them. Following Jesus involves a very, very intense struggle. And I'm going to show you this in, in a big chunk of scripture I'm going to read for you right now. And I just want to, we're not going to take this apart like we have verse 13, but we're going to look at this and see, and I want you to feel the struggle, the antagonism, the intense difference between these two word lists that Paul gives us in this passage. So let's look at Galatians 5, 17 to 23. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit the Holy Spirit. And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Paul mentions this in Romans 7. There are things I want to do that I don't, and things I don't want to do that I do. 
Who will deliver me? Thanks be to God, it's Jesus Christ. Verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, here again, if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. You're not thinking that, oh, I'm great because I'm rule-keeping. You're saying I am who I am because the Spirit of God is dwelling within me. Verse 19, now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Now notice not all of these are behaviors. Some of them are attitudes. I warn you, Paul says, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now the contrast. But the fruit of the Spirit, what the Holy Spirit produces in you, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. What's Paul doing here? He's, He's letting us know that as we follow Jesus, there is a great antagonism going on within us. When when the Spirit is leading you, though, you're not obsessed with earning favor with God. In fact, you're not living with guardrails on the outside. We're in a series right now, Guardrails, looking at warnings throughout the Bible. And here's a warning, how to live rightly in freedom. But listen, listen. The right way to live in freedom is not setting up guardrails and saying, look, God, I'm I'm staying in, I'm staying right within the guardrails, or look, God, I'm not coloring outside of the lines. I'm, I'm, I'm right next to the line, but I'm not going outside of the lines. Aren't you proud of me? No. When you live by the Spirit, The guardrails are moved inside your heart. It's not so much just about your behavior. It's about what motivates your behavior. It's it's what is my motivation? Why do I do those things that I don't want to do? It's not just, I'm not going to do that, and then I'll be righteous. We're asking questions, why do I think this way? Why do I have this kind of an attitude, this rotten attitude toward my wife? Why do I bark at my husband? It's the why question. So the guardrails are inside because Jesus wants to touch you at the place of motivation. That place of motivation in your heart. Freedom is for service, but freedom also involves an intense inner struggle. Intense inner struggle. We must never forget that. See, freedom is something you always have to fight for. And you and I have to fight for it until we get to heaven. There's going to be a battle. That battle doesn't mean that you're a bad person or you are a cursed person. In fact, freedom is knowing the curse has been removed. I'm not under condemnation. Now, I can do some pretty nasty things, some pretty evil things, and I know that I'm not condemned for that. But at the same time, if I'm walking in the Spirit, I'm not just saying, that's no big thing. It's no real serious thing. Freedom involves an intense inner struggle. Now we go to verse 24. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified this thing called the flesh with its passions and desires. Now this verse here is not like Galatians 2.20. In that verse, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live, 
I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's passive. There, Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. In other words, that's a verse that speaks of identity. Jesus died for me, and it's like I was dying with him as he died upon the cross. Here, it's not passive, it's active. And the tense of the verb crucified points back to conversion. When you first put your faith in Jesus, it was like a crucifixion occurred in you. That's a way of saying you repented. You turned from the sin. You walked away from the sin. And positively, you put your faith in Jesus Christ. But it's interesting. Now, that very attitude you had when you first came to Jesus must continue. There must be a continuing repentance in our heart. There must be a continual turning from those, those evil, one, one commentator put it, over desires. It's not that desires are wrong, but our desires become over desires, controlling desires. And so we're controlled by those things, and we need to ask the question, why is that thing controlling me? What needs to be cleaned out? What needs to be crucified? What needs to be executed within me? Listen, Paul is using severe language here. He's saying if there's immorality, if there's sensuality, if there's jealousy, if there's envy, if there's all these things we just read in the list of the works of the flesh, there's only one solution to that. Execution. Execution. You can't give any of those things any space at all in your life. Your motto is no mercy. No mercy for those things that are on that list. They gotta be slaughtered. And listen, it's not just, okay, back at the cross, Jesus died for my sins. According to Jesus, the slaughter needs to happen on a daily basis. In Luke chapter nine, verse 23, Jesus said to all, if anyone would, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So, <laughs> daily crucifixions? Yeah, freedom requires daily crucifixions. Man. So there is a sacrifice involved with freedom. Yeah, sacrifice and death if you really want to live free, if you really want to be an overcomer. Now, John Stott describes crucifixion in three ways. He says, number one, it was pitiless. It was reserved for the worst criminals. And he says, works of the flesh are so evil, they deserve no better fate than to be crucified. And then he says, crucifixion was painful. It's not easy, dear people, to renounce the works of the flesh, but we must do that. And third, he says, crucifixion was decisive. You died. So when Paul says, those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh, what we now do is we continue to reject the sin on a daily basis by metaphorically picking up the cross and saying, there are things in my heart, in my mind, in my life that must die today. They must be executed. Now we close with Paul telling us that the key to living by the Spirit and being led by the Spirit is to line up our lives with the Spirit. Look at Galatians 25 and 26. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step 
with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. The mark of a Spirit-filled person is somebody that's listening to God. You want to walk with the Spirit? You listen to God's Word, and you let the Holy Spirit make impressions on your mind and your heart when you meditate on God's Word. And then your responsibility is to walk in step with, walk in line with the Holy Spirit of God. You say, what does that look like? It, it looks different for different people. God's not always saying the exact same thing to all those who are following him. But he's applying the unchanging word to our changing circumstances all the time. So you listen, you're sensitive, and you don't grieve the Holy Spirit by saying, I'm going to do freedom my way. <laughs> no. Then the voice of God is going to get more and more faint, as we learned a week ago. You long to hear him guide you in the inner places of your heart and your mind. So let's just look at this. Freedom is for service. Freedom is protected when we walk by the Spirit. Freedom involves an intense inner struggle. And real freedom involves daily crucifixions. That's it. That's it. Now, if you are a follower of Jesus and you struggle, would you stand up? Yeah, I'm already standing, folks, okay? It's like, okay. Yeah. We struggle. Would you take a look around? Do a 360, just a quick 360. <laughs> what do you see? <laughs> yeah. I kind of know what he's struggling with. You're looking at fellow strugglers, precious people made in the image of God who are saying unapologetically, yeah, I struggle with the flesh. But Jesus is my Savior. He's my Lord. And he suffered an awful crucifixion, not just the physical pain, but the guilt of all these things I struggle with and too often give into rather than execute. Church, we need to be honest with each other. We need to be open with each other. We're the community of God. His Holy Spirit's living within us. So let's, let's go out boldly, performing the executions that need to be addressed in our lives. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you speak so clearly to us. I pray, Lord, that if there are those here who have been looking at freedom as the right to do what I want to do rather than having the power to do what I ought to do, that they would be convicted of that, that crazy definition of freedom. They would recognize that you have set us free for something. You've set us free so that through love we can serve one another. Lord, remind us when we are struggling with temptation and struggling with sin, and struggling to get the victory. Remind us that there's only one real remedy. We can, we can counsel ourselves till we're blue in the face. We can seek advice from friends and family, but the one thing that we're instructed to do, along with all those other helps, is to have those daily executions. As Jesus said, taking up our cross and daily following him. 
pray that you'd fill us with your Holy Spirit now and that we would listen closely as we walk in line with the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Let's continue worshiping.